Welcome to the Boat Buyer's Secret Weapon. I am your host, Captain Matt. Today we're talking center consoles. We're talking the best. We're talking the worst uh, in the center console market. Now, in March 2021, I attended the Charleston Boat Show, one of the few boat shows that was around in our area. Um, and I spent about eight hours looking at every center console in the Charleston boat show at, at the show. They've got, um, an indoor section and an outdoor section. So I inspected every boat that was in the huge indoor, um, expo hall, the outdoor, there was, you know, there was several boats out there, but uh, we'll get to that. So in the center console market, um, just from the the research I did, which wasn't super extensive, uh, there's probably brands that I'm aware of that I didn't even put on the list, but over 60 fiberglass center console manufacturers from A to Z, you can see them here, and there's there's probably over 100 if you start looking at the different flats boats brands, the different regional brands, uh, the other brands that maybe make some center consoles but mainly focus on uh, dual consoles or bow riders or something like that. So there's a ton of them. And we'll talk about the ones that I inspected and go through, show you pictures and everything. But first, I wanted to kind of explain how center consoles are built. This is going to be an abbreviated version. You can go and watch another video where I go into more detail uh, and take a little bit more time. But essentially, a boat is built from the outside in uh, on these molds. So they'll have a mold for the, for the hull, the bottom part, and a hole for the deck, which is the top part. What they do, the first layer that they put down is the gel coat. The, they've got to prep these molds, and they've got to get them nice and waxed up and ready, and then they'll pop a couple molds out, they'll re-wax it in between, and then every five or ten mold, or every five or ten holes, they're going to re-wax it really good with like seven, eight different coats of wax getting in every crack and crevice. Once you lay that gel coat down, what they're going to do is they're going to start laying the fiberglass. They're usually, depending on the size, on some sort of a, a um, pivot where they can they can rotate it on the axis to do layer at a time. They're going to lay one layer with either chop gun, hand laid, um, and they're going to use different types of materials, and then they're going to flip it over and go to the other side, and they're going to overlap it in the in the center of the hole so it's doubly thick on that keel now the the process goes gel coat and then uh usually a vinyl lester resin uh these days which is going to stop water intrusion from getting into the fiberglass um and then they'll lay um the mats or use a chopper gun you can see in the chopper gun it's got a strand of of the material fiberglass and it mixes with the resin through this hose and they spray it down that's usually going to be the next layer and then they're going to start laying the actual fiberglass mat uh, there's different types different thicknesses different directional weaves that they're going to use for different parts of the boat um, and then they're going to mix that with the resin roll it real good and uh, that's how you make the hull. And they're going to each boat's going to have a different lamination schedule, uh, depending on the the brand of boat, the quality of construction. And they're going to they're going to put different materials in different places. Once that's done, then they're going to lay down some adhesive, and they're going to put a kind of the structure or the stringer systems. It's kind of the backbone of the boat. If you think about the fiberglass hull, it's going to have some flex in it. Once you put that stringer system in, that's going to give it that rigidity that it needs to hold up, and it's going to be designed in a way it, it flexes where it's supposed to flex slightly, uh, but it's got a nice solid setup to it. Those stringer systems are almost all a composite. Um, nobody's really using wood anymore in that uh, that I'm aware of, and um, and they're they're going to be designed to give the ride characteristics or meet the price point. Uh, and give the ride characteristics that they want to build. Once that's in, they're going to pop those molds out. And you can see this is a, actually a red fiberglass um, being popped out. The mold is usually an uh, orange color, I, I guess, so you can see it through. If you're spraying down uh, the glass, you can see that orange color through it. Um, and, and they're they're going to pull those out. Once they pull them out, right next to that whole mold is going to be a deck mold that's built the same way fiberglass or gel coat, uh, chop gun, maybe, uh, fiberglass and resin, 
and then they're going to marry those together once they attach all of the accessories, the wiring harnesses, uh, everything that needs to be attached before the boat goes together. Because you can imagine, once you put this together, then you can't tighten up a through-haul fitting. You can't tighten up a uh, cleat. You can't tighten up any of the hardware, um, and, and you can't get access to a lot of stuff, which maybe you've experienced if you're a boater. So this is the way a lot of boats are built. Hull, deck, married together. They bring them together, and they fit here. They're going to put some adhesive and some sealer, and then they're going to screw it down, and then they're going to put a rub rail on it and screw it down some more, uh, and then they're going to caulk between the any gaps that are left, okay? That's kind of the basic process. Now, some manufacturers are going to put a third layer in, which is a fiberglass liner. Um, those fiberglass liners are going to be built the same way, but what it allows them to do is it gives it more structural support with the hull, the stringer system, then the liner, and then the deck, um, but it's also going to allow it to have a finished fiberglass surface as you open up different compartments and as you um, go to certain areas of the boat because they're the raw fiberglass layer is going to be facing down towards the stringers and the finished gel coat is going to be facing up towards the um, to the top where you're going to open things up. So that's the building process. This is a look at as you as you fit them together, there can be a gap between the hull and the deck even after that rub rail is attached or the um, is all screwed down. That gap um, shouldn't be there. So it basically means that things don't fit together as well. But either way, they're going to put some sealant around the whole exterior of the boat because what you don't want to happen is to water go rushing up in between the hull and the deck, get in between there, and uh, cause some damage. Okay, So that's the build process. Now, the next thing as you're looking to how do you rate the best and the worst is, okay, what's the lamination schedule? How is it built? Do they have a fiberglass liner? What do their stringers look like? Um, what hardware do they use? And the hardware is going to be anything that they attach to the boat. It could be 3 sixteenths stainless, which is the best, um, the best combination of alloy. 306, which is a little bit cheaper, a uh, little bit less durable, or aluminum. And then they also may use some plastic, uh, the plastic or maybe a chrome-plated plastic. Um, and, and that's going to determine... You know, as you add all of these things up, you're going to say, okay, now I can put this in a category of this is what I call a value brand. This is kind of the mid tier where they do a lot of good stuff, but not everything is perfect. And then the the top end, the top tier, which is going to be very luxury, um, rock solid built, um, but the price is going to be up there. Here's why some of that's important is things like this. If you don't in the lamination schedule, if you don't backplate where hardware is going to go, where through hauls are going to go, what can happen is you can have um, a, a piece of hardware fail like this. So typically what they're going to do is they're going to put a piece of what's called starboard, like plastic, in the lamination schedule. So it's going to go gel coat, fiberglass, um, starboard, more fiberglass, and then it's going to be sandwiched in between there to give a nice solid surface that's going to distribute the weight and the force through that entire area uh, and not pull out like you see here. Then the other thing that is going to determine is um, the value is what kind of water systems they have, raw water coming in, freshwater tanks, and how do they do the plumbing? Do they have seacocks where you can turn water on and off and access? Um, are they using two um, hose clamps? Um, how are they doing the hose clamps? Are the hoses just flapping around, or are they mounted down and, and kind of dressed back? All of that's going to go into it, and this is what I inspected on all of these boats as much as I can. The lamination schedule, Listen, you got to kind of pound on the boat in different areas to see how thick it is, how much fiberglass, what that looks like. But unless you cut it in half, you don't really know. So it takes some experience. It takes some knowledge. Um, the other thing that I did is I lumped all center consoles together. I didn't break out the different styles within center consoles, a flats boat, a bay boat, the hybrid, uh, what I kind of consider a regular center console and an offshore boat. Um, and the reason I didn't is because it's not really a hard and fast rule, okay? So 
the the flats boat and the skiffs, man, they're they're smaller, shallow draft. Usually have a polling platform on them, which you can barely see in this picture. The bay boat is going to be not very deep, not much gunnel, um, and uh, it's they're going to be a little bit smaller. The hybrids get a little bit bigger, a little bit deeper. Center console gets even deeper, um, a, a more aggressive dead rise, that angle of the hole, which again, if you go watch my how to buy a center console video, I go into more detail on that, talking about dead rise, lifting strikes and all that. Uh, and then the offshore boats, which are the bigger yet more aggressive um, lifting strikes, more aggressive dead rise uh and, and but what one manufacturer may call a, a hybrid another may call a bay boat um so it's it's not really a set in stone thing it's just sort of a, a spectrum uh just so that you're aware of that now these are the boats that i actually inspected so i have laid my eyes on some of them i've been to the factory um some of them I, I boarded you know one boat at the show some of them i boarded 10 boats at the show and i'm going to show you all of that okay so we're going to start with the value brands mako tidewater sea fox and trophy the from the ones that i inspected we'll start with tidewater tidewater is a boat that it's made within an hour from where i've lived i've been not in their factory uh, but I've been to their factory and, and to their offices. I just haven't done a, a complete tour there. Um, I've always thought it was a great boat. Um, looks looks solid. Uh, you know, good looking boat, especially on that trailer. When I walked up to it, um, I, I really like the seat backs that they've got. They will will flip back and, and go up towards the um, uh, towards the hull side, and, and so you can adjust it to family family friendly boating or we're going to do some fishing i thought that was a, a great seat they must have it patented and then i started looking into the details of the boat this is under the helm you can see i pulled back that um that little curtain area uh and here's here's what i see here is i, I see just a a lot of stuff that's not real clean the wiring Yes, it's in it's in some wiring harnesses here, but you've got battery cable that's just kind of coiling around. You've got the um, the freshwater wash down, or I don't know if it's freshwater or not, but the wash down just kind of coiled up. It's not going into uh, they'll typically go into like a bag or something like that, just so they're it's maintained. Now, and just the wiring to me seems unwieldy. Um, and that was that was one of the first things I noticed as I looked in as I started getting further in. Um, you know, a chip in the in the uh, powder coating on the T-top, uh, a stripped out screw where the finish piece is off. And this is a, a brand new boat at the boat show. Um, a bunch of caulk down at the bottom that really it doesn't even look like that. Um, that T-top is really flush on the bottom um, and then more sealant around the light which is good. You're going to seal everything on a boat because you don't want water to get into the, um, especially salt water into the lighting, into the electrical, but you can just see on that purple arrow, it's just, it's messy. It's not real clean. Um, even the, um, even the black, I, I forget what that material is called. It's kind of an adhesive and a sealant all in one. It just, it doesn't look very finished the the fit and finish you'll hear um to me on this boat was was um disappointing uh from what i'd expected on this hatch there's no gasket there's nothing that's going to keep that from rattling a little bit it does have a latch so it's going to lock down a little bit tight um, but it's also there's there's no gasket to keep the water out uh which was was um something that you'll see on on some of the other pictures as i was looking at at some of the gel coat this was on the helm. You can see this big scratch. Now, that could come from a couple different things. It could have come from uh, a knife when they were cutting it open, getting the getting the plastic wrap off or, or something during the rigging process. It could have also come from the fact that the mold wasn't prepped as well as it should be and um, got some dirt in it, and now that gel coat didn't pop out of the mold as well as it should have on that deck piece. And I found this type of thing on several different areas of several different boats. So um, my thought is it's probably in the in the um, preparation of the molds. But again, it, it, this one could be something a little bit different. 
The hardware, you know, I always look at hinges. Uh, these are decent hinges. Uh, they look to be stainless steel. Um, an, another, this is a cleat inside the anchor locker. So that's just to tie the anchor road off, uh, which is fine. That works great. A lot of people do it that way. You can see another little blemish on the gel coat right there. Um, but the foam. So in these center consoles, they're, the standard is to make sure that they're going to float uh, if there was to be a catastrophic issue with the hull, you were to, to run aground, um, for whatever reason you take on water, there's a certain amount of foam that needs to be in it so the boat continues to float if something happens offshore so that you have something to cling to. Um, I was just I was disappointed. Yes, this is the anchor locker, and yeah, you're just going to throw that with your anchor road and your chain in there, um, but it's it was so noticeable that, um, that I took a picture of it, wanted to show that as well. Um, again, when it comes to the fit and finish on the upholstery, on this combing panel, uh, this, this upholstery piece right here, you can see the mounting bracket where it slides on. And it was like that on every single one that I looked at. So that's just the design where it's, it's visible. Um, you can see the single stitching on the upholstery, um, which is okay. But uh, again, it puts it for me in the value category when you start adding all this together. This is the transom where the motor is mounted. And that's another place where the hull and deck will come together. Um, and they also, they put this little finishing piece on, which is great. And then they sealed it. But that sealant was really, really thick, which made me believe that there's probably a pretty good gap there uh, between that finishing piece and where the actual um, edge of the transom is, uh, which, again, over time, that caulking is going to degrade and it's going to shrink and it's going to dry a little bit, just naturally what happens. And you're going to have to recaulk that and reseal it. If you don't, you're going to get water, water intrusion in one of the most susceptible areas um, of the boat that's going to cause delamination where those different layers of fiberglass and material start coming apart and you lose some structural integrity. Um, uh, this is another thing, again, it's minor, but this backrest is off. If you look at level on these lines, um, it just, it's, it's off. Um, and it, it wasn't loose. It was, it was a fixed the way it should be. Um, they just mounted it crooked, uh, which tells me that, you know, the, the level of craftsmanship in Tidewater was not what I was expecting. Um, I was expected to be a mid tier boat, but it, uh, to me definitely falls in the value category. The filler cushion, you know, it's kind of flipping up um, and, and it's not really thick. Not a big deal um, if that was the only thing. But with everything else, I put it in the value category. This is the where the hole in the deck come together. That's, a, again, a lot of a lot of adhesive or caulk um, to go in between that, which tells me that the hole in the, the deck don't really come together as tight as I would like them to. So that's the tide water. The next is the trophy. A good-looking boat, um, you know, they're they're basically uh, a bay liner, um, their center console line, and uh, they've just brought these back in the last year or so. Um, and, and first time that I've inspected the new one, so this was the one that was inside. The first thing I noticed on the outside one was the horn. The horn is down below on the um, you know where it's going to get splashed up with water in the in the rough water you take on a big wave and that thing's going to get splashed with water and it's going to go out in the first season almost guaranteed um, you know 150 200 250 dollars to replace a horn um, that's not something you want position there I thought that was pretty poor engineering unless there's something about that horn I don't know. Um, these are also built in Mexico. If that's important to people to know where they're built, most boats, uh, other than a handful, uh, Sea Ray builds a couple of their, their SPXs down in Florida or down in Mexico and, um, and Bayliner builds down in Mexico. This trophy was as well. Um, the other thing that put it in the value category is these plastic through haul fittings over time. The sun, the UV, the water is going to degrade this plastic and they're going to have to be replaced. If you don't catch it in time and it starts leaking, that means your boat could potentially sink. Um, so it's those little details on these builds that if you're not experienced, you may not recognize and you may say, well, why is this boat um, $10,000 more than this trophy? Well, it's these little things that start adding up. 
Um, and, and not that it makes it a bad boat. I, I, I we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, this was a boat that was in the showroom, and you can see the rip in the T-top. Again, this is on the trophy. Um, and uh, again, could have been ripped on the move-in. Uh, but more than likely it was ripped from something in the, in, in the usage of it that caused that to happen. A little blemish in the gel coat there, a little nick in the upholstery here. Now this was a demo boat that the dealer had used a handful of times. Um, but if a handful of times is going to cause this kind of little stuff to break, when you buy it new, similar stuff is going to happen. And that's why I'm pointing it out. Um, the material isn't as thick, isn't as durable. Um, I, I pointed out the, the plastic that's in use. And then little things like this. This is the uh, back seat. It folds down for a casting platform. It flips up, locks in place when you're, when you're cruising in need of the seat. This ro rubber stopper, very common uh, on a, a value and even some mid-tier boats. But what really caught me was this unfinished fiberglass. So what that means is over time, you can see that the fiberglass strands in there. If one of those pokes out of kind of that paint layer, um, and that's going to jam, they're very sharp. It's like getting stuck with the, with the knife kind of. And um, because of where this is positioned, when you're putting that seat up and down, the kids are going to grab that section of it probably um, and, and it's going to happen eventually. It's just a matter of when I thought that was pretty poor design for, um, for the long haul uh, on this, uh, on this trophy, the hardware, you know, this wasn't a, I think this was a 21 foot boat. It, it's not huge. Um, it does appear to be stainless steel, but when I saw the, the, uh, fixture for the light, um, you know, it told me it's probably, the cheaper grade of stainless, which means you're going to have more issue with corrosion. You're going to have to do more polishing to keep it from, uh, from getting, getting really bad. And, um, again, this was a demo boat, but it was the boat that was being showed at the boat show. And, um, and I was, I was not super impressed. The Mako, they weren't at the show, but I've inspected these at Bass Pro Shops because they're a major brand and uh, they sell a lot of boats through their distribution at Bass Pro and Cabela's. I wanted to um, review it. The, um, the bifold door on the center console, what it tells me is that there's that room in between the center console and the gunnel, the hull side, isn't very big to walk through that they've got to do. They couldn't actually open the door all the way through. Um, they had to do the bifold, which isn't bad in itself, but eventually it's going to start rattle. It's going to get looser quicker, and um, and it means that that walkthrough is, is pretty tight. The screws on the hardware on this cleat, well, that's a prime place for salt water to collect and start corrosion and kind of seep in there and cause issues versus having that be a solid piece with bolts through. And then you've got to go through and, and rebolt it underneath. Um, and you know, it, it's little things again, the rub rail, you can see the, the screw there, that screw head. And then because that post goes through that little receptacle, that's another place for corrosion to kind of get started because salt, and, um, and it's going to get in there. Sand is going to get in there and cause some issues. You can see the lifting strakes, not significant on this. Um, I, I watched a review on, um, on the boat test, uh, and, and he didn't want to say it because they get paid to do those reviews. Um, but, uh, the handling of the boat seemed to not be up to par in uh, Captain Steve's opinion. And, and you can see it right there. The lifting strikes are pretty slim, which means that you're not going to get the most efficient, the biggest, the best grab when you're in rough chop and, and making turns uh, under speed. The, um, the windshield, just acrylic plastic. Um, again, not terrible, but definitely puts it in the value category. And this was the little strap down system that they used for uh, the cooler, which over time, that, that little compartment, that little uh, cutout there gets filled with sand and dirt and grime and uh, corrosion. It's tough to keep clean and it gets scratched up. And then five years later, it's, um, you know, you, you've got some issues with it. So here's my thoughts on the value category. By no means are any of these boats unsafe. All of the boats that I inspected were very seaworthy, are not going to cause problems. The The way that they're building boats today is 
um, good, way better than what was 20 years ago. Even the cheapest boat today is built better than, um, than what they were doing you know, 15, 20 years ago. They've got the same motors, so it's going to have a Yamaha, a Mercury, a Suzuki, or a Honda on it, um, the same as any of the premium tier, which is 30 to 50% of the cost of a boat in some cases is the power. So the, what you're getting with the value boat is you're getting a bigger boat with the same type of engine that you would on a, a mid-tier or a premium level boat, but you're getting some of the the maintenance is going to be more as, as far as upkeep little things are going to break and happen like tearing in the T top, uh, a, a gap in the, a gap in the, um, caulking that you're going to have to continue to maintain to keep that in good working order. Things are going to break. Things aren't as durable. They don't lay as much fiberglass. It's not as heavy. It's not as sturdy. It's not going to give you as good of a ride. And that's what you're going to get in a value boat, but you get the warranty um, you get hopefully a good dealer support, which we'll talk about that later, but, um, but you don't have the risk of buying used. I, I think that's where the value category comes in. You can get a bigger boat or you can get a boat that has less likelihood of motor breaking down, um, and, and not being covered by warranty. If you want to know how to kind of inspect a boat yourself and what to check, you can go check out the Boat Buyer's Toolkit. You can grab that for free, boatbuyersecretweapon.com slash toolkit. And let's get into the mid-tier. So in the mid-tier, these are the ones, the most brands, because this is where most people are going to fall, somewhere in the middle um, of the road. Sea Hunt, Scout, Pathfinder, Sportsman, Key West, Sea Pro, Nautic Star, Rabalo, and Creval. They're all going to be... Um, in that mid tier and there's kind of a scale in there, but, um, but, but I put them all in here because it's going to give you a, a good solid boat, but they do, they do some things that the premium level don't, but the price point is going to be less. So this, we'll start with the sea hunt. These are in no particular order either. Uh, one, it's a great looking boat. I didn't love the color of this one, but, um, the lines, it's a good solid looking boat. Um, you can see on the transom how they cap it. And you can see that level of, of sealant of caulk right there is pretty, is pretty thin. Um, you can barely even see it there. They've got it screwed down, which means that you're not going to get that water intrusion in one of the most susceptible areas um, to, to having that issue. When you start looking at the hardware, nice, big, heavy-duty hardware, um, good stainless steel hinges, um, big heavy duty latch there. This was something I was a little bit disappointed in were on the T top. They didn't really finish off the T top. They kind of got that raw cut out there. I, I would have thought there would have been some sort of gasket or, or some finishing piece on this section. And then the same thing on this yellow arrow that cut through, um, is just, is the raw fiberglass. And, um, it, it, you know, in my mind, eventually it could cause some chafing. It's probably not a huge deal, but it just, it didn't look as nice as, as what I would expected. And then you've got the unfinished, um, side of it because the exterior is going to be the finished gel coat. And we talked about how the process is built. Uh, that's what happens is you've got one side that's unfinished in the traditional way of, of laying glass. Um, nice full length piano hinge here. Uh, with the strap, which is common in the in a live well, um, but that's all set up right. Again, you can tell they don't have a liner in this one because when you open up the compartments, it's unfinished fiberglass that's just been painted. Uh, over time, that paint can kind of deteriorate. You can get those little fiberglass shards like I talked about on the trophy seat. Um, but again, in the mid-tier, that's kind of what you're going to expect in a lot of cases uh, because adding that extra fiber, that fiberglass liner, it costs more. You've got another mold. You've got more material. You got more work, um, and um, and so in some of them they leave that out uh, because of those reasons. And and it's then it's a matter of what how you're going to use the boat and the price point you're looking to hit. Good stainless steel through haul fittings. Um, a, a pretty a pretty good lifting strake. You'll see on some of the bigger boats, some of the more premium boats that uh, that gets bigger, and the size of the boat determines that too. You can see a gasket around this uh, compartment which is going to give it, um, stop it from rattling as much, and it's going to give it a nice tight fit so uh, less water gets in there. 
the wiring, I always check the wiring on a boat. If it looks nice and neat and everything's dressed back, you got easy access to the fuses. Um, they've got things wire tied down. Um, that is a good sign that you're looking at a mid-tier or a, a premium manufacturer. But again, you can see unfinished fiberglass in that compartment. Um, and this is under the head. Uh, next, we'll move to Scout. Now, I sold Scout when I was selling boats, so I, I know it pretty well. I've been to the factory, um, and I think it's one of the best looking in the mid-tier category. Um, I, I like they do some little things like wrapping the swim platform around a little bit. They've got great lines. They use, they've always done, uh, they were one of the first ones to do the colored uh, upholstery uh, to go for looks and not just the stark white. Uh, back 10 years ago or so, but a, a good solid boat, heavy duty hardware. You can see that upholstery. Um, they've always done a, a nice job of, of making good looking boats that are um, both the, the fisherman and the family person is going to like. Um, as you look at the hardware, you can see this hinge on the seat, big, heavy duty, um, nice, solid um, hardware that they're using. Um, you can see the cap. Nice stainless steel cap on the uh, on the transom, stainless steel through haul fittings, a good looking rub rail. This is one thing that um, a, a plastic uh, spray down that wash down. You can see the and the the uh, sprayer actually broke off. Now on the more premium bands, this is going to be stainless steel likely, and um, it's easy enough to swap out. But you know something that was broke on a brand new boat that um that was at the boat show so that puts them in that in that mid-tier category just because you're going to find little things like that now sportsman uh, another boat um scouts built in charleston sportsman are built in charleston sea pros built in charleston um or no sea fox is built in charleston sea pros in columbia all columbia is about an hour from me charleston's about three three and a half hours from me and the sportsman again i've been to the factory um, have met the, uh, have met the owner and several people there. Um, I, I like the boats and we'll talk about some things they do really well, but this is something that I didn't particularly care for. This looks nice on the grab handle, but if you look close up, it's the same thing that, um, I, I'm not sure which one it was that we just went through, but this is a spot where you're, I think it was the Mako where you're going to get salt and sand and you're going to get corrosion starting in that area because it's going to be real tough to get that good and clean. Um, same thing with the screw head on top is that's a place for water to collect and that corrosion to get started. So it looks great. Um, but for maintenance wise, I think, oh man, I, I would think I would rather just like a, a full size piece, the gasket around. Um, now, if you look at this hatch, um, that's got finished fiberglass on the hatch, which means they're actually building this part with a different process called closed molding, um, where they, they spray it with gel coat and they, they layer, um, they layer the fiberglass and the resin, and then they use a vacuum process where they suck all the air out. So you can get finished gel coat on both sides. Uh, they call it what small piece, um, manufacturing, uh, and you'll see some manufacturers will do that with their hatches and and small pieces that they can mold in, in-house themselves, but not everybody does it, um, but it, it looks great when they do it. It's more expensive to do, and it's a, a tough process to do larger parts. Um, again, nice heavy-duty stainless steel. They do have what I think is, is a great system, and I think it's probably patented. I don't remember what they call it. Uh, but if you see this um, stainless steel grate down here, that's actually the the drain that's going to drain out. Uh, if you take a wave over, if rain comes in, um, water is going to drain through there and then drain out the side of the scuppers. But they go down to a collection box, uh, which is under here, which means that it's going to get water off the deck quicker than if you didn't have it, if you just went right out to the scupper. Also, if you've got a lot of weight in the back um, and you weight that scupper down below the water level, it's not going to rush back in the boat. Um, some of them have a, will have a little flap valve, so it, it tries to stop it. Um, but this system where they all, all their drains go to this drainage box and over the side is, is really efficient. And, um, there's a lot of advantages to it, which I, I really like that. Uh, and I saw it in, in the building process on some of the boats when I was at the factory, uh, and I was real impressed the, although they're probably using the three sixteenth stainless, this was a demo boat. You started to see, um, some of this showing up 
which means maybe it just didn't get cleaned up that well or sprayed off. But, um, you know, something that I wanted to show on this nice, big, heavy duty stainless steel piano hinge, which is going to be nice and durable. The uh, starboard or, or plastic seat base with the drains, uh, which is, is what you want to see. That looks really good. Um, I like the, the pullout for the cooler. Uh, but just the other thing, I liked how tight the T-top was to the center console. You can see that's about an inch bracket there that um, affixes it again. So it's going to be nice and sturdy attached. You're not going to have to worry about what can happen uh, is somebody grabbing on in rough seas, somebody grabbing onto that T-top, and you got a bunch of force on it, and it pulls right out of the floor. Um, and it's also as tight as they can, so it's not a huge toe stubber as you've got people going through um, by that center console. There's a nice walkway. Um, again, they don't have the stainless steel, but a nice finish piece. You can see it's it's nice and tight, and it fits well, which is is the key to that area. Key West, another boat that I, I really like and, um, and think they do a, a nice job. They've got the stainless steel finish piece on the transom. You can see the through-haul fittings are stainless. It, it fits well uh, across there. Um, kind of a thin bow cushion. That bow filler cushion is a little bit thin, uh, but they've got the full-piece grab handle, that stainless steel, and uh, some nice upholstery. Uh, I was kind of disappointed in their transom walkthrough. That, that padding from the uh, backrest is going to hit the combing panel there and um, and it doesn't allow it to open fully. Not a huge deal, but it, it's, it's a little thing that put it in the, in that, um, that mid tier category. Uh, and then again, this is one of their bigger boats um, and they do a fully capped um, piece on the, um, uh, on the transom where the, the motor mount is the wiring looks great everything's dressed back everything is is wire tied up the way it should be um, but you do have the the raw fiberglass so they're they're just painting over the that interior section of the fiberglass not a big deal in this compartment they do have a, a little finishing piece of upholstery that goes over it which is a lot what a lot of them do it cleans it up it looks nicer protects the wiring and um, and it's a less expensive way to do it so that um, that they could keep the price point valuable for more people. Roballo, uh, same company as Chaparral, the um, uh, the stern drive bow riders that uh, has been around for a while that do a great job. I was kind of disappointed in the upholstery. It, it was it was stitched okay, uh, but I just thought it was it looked kind of cheap. It was real slick and glossy, which is great for taking care of it. Um, but but I I wasn't a huge fan of the looks. Um, they do make all of their own upholstery and cushions in-house, um, which isn't super uncommon, but um, they cut their own foam. You can see the foam that they use. It's got a, a dense foam on top for comfort and then a real porous foam um, so it drains out the water so that those seat cushions don't get mildewy and musty as easily. Um, and if you look at the stitching, um, really good job of the stitching um, on the interior. And you can see it on the, on the edge there. And again, they, they do that in-house. The hatches, again, they've painted these, which they, they got a nice thick layer of coating on that, but it's not that closed molded process like, um, um, like some of the others have used where it's got gel coat on both sides. Again, it's, it's just a detail that may not be important to you at all, but it does bring the price up a little bit. Uh, with everything being the same. This is something Roballo did that I really liked is their forward opening door for their head compartment, the access into their center console, storage, whatever you want. Um, not finished fiberglass. So it's just, they've got painted over the, over the raw fiberglass. And um, I, I don't know, I don't know any other manufacturers that are doing this. I don't know if it's a patented thing, if there's a reason why, um, you wouldn't want to do it that way, but I, I, I like that. I couldn't think of the negative and I was, I was trying to, but that's the Roballo. So as we've gone through the, we haven't got to the top tier yet, but I'd love to hear your experience of your year and make of the boat, what I got right, what I got wrong. If I missed something, you own one of these brands. Um, let me know, let me know your thoughts. And, and if I missed a brand that uh, people should know about, let me know that as well. Uh, just put that down in the comments. Top tier. Okay, so top tier Blackfin, Whaler, Edgewater, Everglades, Grady, Pursuit, and Regulator. Now, Pursuit and Regulator, um, I did not inspect 
on site. They were outside, but I've been to the regulator facility and have a, a good amount of experience with pursuit. So we'll start with Blackfin. Um, this was one of the biggest boats there uh, that they had on display indoors, and it, it was it was beautiful. The fit and finish, um, the details. Like if, if you look down, um, and this was really easy to get a good picture of. Some of the smaller ones you couldn't uh, get access as easy, but you can see the two um, hose clamps which means that if one comes loose, you still aren't going to spring a leak. And if that goes through the through hole, um, you're going to sink your boat. So the, it's important things to do that you, you wouldn't really notice it. Uh, it's the standards that uh, ABYC have set, but not everybody follows those standards. And uh, you want to make sure that, you know, the little details like um, clamping these hoses all down so that they, they aren't just flopping around um, is going to keep them from chafing and, and getting a hole in it. You got all your pumps and your strainers marked, easy access, and, and you know what's what, and uh, you can get to it um, and uh, and see what's going on. Your electrical panel, just the, the finish of everything, the details was real nice. Grady, um, you know, Grady White, you can say they haven't kept up with the times. They're they're too old fashioned, but and they're heavy, but they build a tank. I mean, this thing is you pound on the whole sides and you, you hurt your hand. Um, the only one that I think is, is stronger is Whaler. That's because of their construction process, which we'll talk about. Um, but full length piano hinges, the nice full gasket. Look at how big that gasket is to seal, keep it from rattling. Um, the mirror, just the details of the Grady are are incredible. The hardware that they use, the stainless steel through haul fittings, um, as you look at the boat, I mean, just everything about it says this thing is rock solid. The the hardware all the way around that you see, um, even this little this little piece here, that's actually how they put the screws in. If they're going to put a hinge on or a gas assist strut, um, they're going to attach it to that, and um, it just it looks nicer. Uh, and it's going to be less maintenance because that's going to spray off and clean easier, and um, it's going to make it more durable over time. But um, just everything that they did, as you stepped on these Grady's, uh, it was just impressive. Uh, now, it's reflected in the price for sure, but if you want the best of the best, the, this is the category that you want to look in. Um, the stitching, the uh, weight of the upholstery, just heavy duty, another ga uh, big piano hinge. Um, this is what I was talking about. So you've got finished fiberglass in the T-top electronic cabinet. Um, you've got the little finished piece there that um, as you're mounting things, you can take that off, get easy access to run the wiring, put that back on, and it finishes off nicely. Um, and just, uh, again, the I think it was the C-Hunt C that had the unfinished edges. This is just the difference between premium and um, and that mid tier, and again, you pay for it. The Everglades, I couldn't get a good profile shot of the Everglades. It was stuck in between these two catamarans, uh, but just a, a well built boat. You can tell looking at the helm seat. Um, you know, you can adjust that, and it's got this big, huge handle to make it easy. Um, several different adjustment points on it. Um, heavy duty hardware. The the T top is mounted. They're not going down to the, down to the, to the deck. Um, it, it's mounted there, mounted through a nice big solid piece, just well done all the way around on the, on the Everglades. They only had one there. Um, so it was, it was hard to get different perspectives, but you can just see the, the finishing piece on the transom, um, was, uh, looked great capped all the way around the, uh, head compartment, you know, just some details that you get as you look at that top level. The whalers, I, I didn't get any pictures of the whalers for some reason, but I sold whaler as well. I've been to the whaler factory, um, and, and you know, the reputation of whaler is you know, speaks for itself. The durability of their boats is to me, it, it's really tough to beat. It goes to the way that they build them. So, unlike the other brands that we've looked at, they don't they don't bring the deck and the hull together um, and then screw it. What they do is they actually bring the deck and the hull together and clamp it, and then they fill it with, uh, call it a foam shot. So they fill it with this foam that expands as it, uh, well, I don't know what the catalyst is. They probably put something in. It expands and it fills every crack and crevice 
um, instead of having that stringer system, it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna go through every crack and crevice in addition to the support structures that they put in there. Um, and it's it allows it to you're just you can't sink it. That's why they called it the unsinkable legend. Now everybody has had to build their boats to be unsinkable, um, but because of the way Whaler does it, um, I mean you can tear the bottom off your boat and you're you're gonna float level um, and and you're gonna float for a long time. They also build within the the lamination schedule they're going to build their mounting points and then you've got that foam that goes through it and they mount right into the plastic here's what you got to be careful of because of this build process if you just start going mounting things into the hole sides uh, or screwing into the deck somewhere and you don't hit one of those mounting plates you're going to just screw right in and now you've got a place for water to intrude and get in this foam. So if you're looking at a used whaler, you want to kind of look at the weight of the boat, um, see if they have anything where they've mounted it, because that can get water in. And once you get water in this foam on any of the boats, but especially the whalers, it's just that boat's just heavier uh, than it needs to be, and it's uh, it, it can be problematic. So um, something to consider. But uh, the whaler, if you ride on a whaler, the the sound absorption, the ride quality, the way they build their holes is um, is tough to beat, and, and just the reputation of owning a whaler is um, you know if you've been around boating, you've you've heard the name probably. Regulator, uh, uh, they do a good job of building a boat that's ready to go offshore, handle the rough conditions, the big huge lifting strakes that they use, give it a, a rock solid ride, good good efficiency good um, handling and rough chop. Um, and again, I've been to the regulator factory and um, they do they do a great job. There's a, a good look at that reverse chine on the outside there, the big, huge uh, lifting straights here. You can see those coming down, the big heavy duty anchor uh, through the windlass. I mean, just it, it's a solid, the big Carolina flare. I think they're a great looking boat and, uh, and, and well built. The hardware, you know, you go through it, finished fiberglass on the hatches, uh, finished fiberglass because they use that liner system. So it goes hull, stringers, liner, deck. And that liner gives you finished fiberglass when you open up a compartment. They also use that closed molded um, system to make their small parts. All of these hatches uh, and different pieces have finished fiberglass on both sides. The gasket, the heavy duty, heavy duty gas assist struts, the heavy duty hardware throughout. Uh, and then pursuit boats. Um, pursuit is one that I, I haven't been to the factory, but um, but I've been on several of them. They they do a great job with the luxury on a, a saltwater boat. Um, they do some center consoles, but I think it's their dual consoles that they do extremely well with the cabins and uh, just doing a good mix of, yeah, you can fish it, but you can entertain on those boats. And um, and the luxury really comes through where, like Boston Whaler, I see they do a great job with luxury, but just the, the build and the grady are the same thing. Um, it, it's just a, a category that's, that's a, a step above. And then you, you see it in the, the price sticker too. Uh, and then this one is the Edgewater. Uh, they only had one there. They were they had a couple that was very interested in it, looking at the boat. So I didn't get to go through it as well as I would have liked to. Um, but great lines. I was impressed with what I saw. Um, the finish on the transom, the hardware, the rod holders, the bait well, uh, all of that was, uh, was very impressive. Again, you can see you can see that hardware. This is what the gas assist strut looks like when you just screw it into the um, screw it into the hatch uh, versus that um, Grady where they had that little finished tab. Now it's not a huge deal, but it's it's a little thing, and um, and Grady did did that real well. So here's my suggestion. So I've just given you, hey, I just went through a whole boat show and um, and gave you my opinion and um, of what you're going to see. But here's my suggestions for you if you're shopping for something in this category is the first thing is you want to choose the right style, the right quality tier, and the right size. So the reason I say that is as I was going through the show and you looked at the premium tier, you saw a lot of the same hardware, um, a lot of the same build um, processes. As you looked at the medium, that mid-tier, you saw the same exact hardware, 
sometimes very similar upholstery, very similar everything, similar price tags. And there's not much difference between boat to boat in those categories. That's why I laid them out this way. And in the value, hey, you saw they're different things that they do good and and they where they cut price or cut corners to get the price down. Um, But those boats, I would say, would all handle, operate and give you a similar experience. So what I suggest is that you narrow it down to two, three or four brands that you like within that category. And then you make your decision based on dealer and the deal that you're going to get. Why the dealer is so important on a new boat is because, and we're going to talk about used in just a second, is because no matter what boat you buy, there's going to be something that goes wrong with it in the first year, something warranty-wise, something where you're going to need some assistance. And the better relationship and the better dealer you work with, the more convenient they are at times, the better happier your boating life is going to be. Um, That dealer makes a huge difference. So if I was going back and forth between three boats, I liked uh, this about, and they were very similar. Pricing was similar in the same ballpark. I would choose the brand, not based on the brand of boat, but based on the dealer that carried that brand, who I had the best relationship with, um, who was seemed to be uh, the best fit and was going to take care of me the best, the best reputation. Uh, I would talk to the service manager. I was talk to the service techs if I could. I would talk to the general manager or the owner and get a sense for how well they're going to take care of you. And that would be my deciding factor. And then the the deal that I got as well, the price that you're going to get is going to come into that. I, I look at that as the best dealer is who's going to who's going to give you um, a, a good value uh, for your money. Now, if you're looking used, I've got a little different opinion because here's the thing is on a used boat, three to five years or more old, if it was going to break, it's probably already broken or has shown that this is an area that you're going to have to have issues. They've all got the same engine for the most part, but it matters how well has it been maintained and treated. So if you look, you're going to get a little bit different ride, of course, but if you look at what's going to give you the least headaches, well, if it, if it was a Trophy or, or a Mako or one of those value brands, if it was going to break, it's broken, and it's either been fixed or it hasn't, but you can make your decision based on that. Um, same thing, if you go buy a, a Boston Whaler or a Grady or a, a Pursuit or a Regulator or any of those top tiers, and it's been not maintained very well, it's going to be a nightmare. So it's more about maintaining it. And that's where that toolkit and the first time Boat Buyers Academy comes in on new and used, where I walk you through the seven savvy steps to make sure you make a smart decision, get the perfect boat, new or used from a dealer or private seller at the absolute best price to help you negotiate so you can buy it with 100% confidence. Uh, You can check that out at boatbuyersecretweapon.com slash academy. But that's my advice on the used side is it's more about how it's been maintained and treated than it is about the particular brand. And I, I see people all the time get hung up on the brand when it's more about the boat after that first three to five years um, because a, a premium boat that hasn't been taken care of is going to be a nightmare. A value boat that's been well taken care of could give you 10 years of boating fun for a great value. Um, and then it's just a matter of your personal preference. Again, we talk about that in the First Time Boat Buyers Academy that um, that you can check out. Now, you can't talk about center consoles without talking about outboard power, right? Which is the best one? Well, Evinrude obviously is is no longer there. If you're looking used, make sure you've got an Evinrude technician that you can that will service it. Make sure that you can get parts. Depending on you know, at some point, parts are going to get harder and harder to come by uh, on different models. It's just the nature of them going out of business and stopping, uh, or not going out of business, stopping building the Evinrudes. When it comes to Honda, Mercury, Suzuki, Yamaha. Here's the best one. The best one is the one that you're going to have the best service technician to support you. So what I mean by that is if the dealer sells 10 Hondas a year and 100 Suzukis or 100 Yamahas or 100 Mercuries or vice versa, 10 Mercuries and 100 Yamahas, I'm going to go with the power if I can 
that they have they sell a hundred of those because they're gonna they're gonna be more well versed in it. They're gonna be better equipped. They're gonna have more of those parts on hand and can get me turned around quicker. They're gonna have all the latest diagnostic equipment and software. They're gonna know and have come across issues that may be a service bulletin. They're gonna be able to to notify you and address those issues be, before you have a breakdown on the water. That's my recommendation. Same thing on used. On used is hey. It's got what it's got. You can't change it. Just make sure you've got a technician that can do your your mechanical work, um, your repair, if you need it. If you're going to do your own, it's a little bit different story. Buy the manual and uh, and learn that thing. But for the outboard, the best one is the one that's got the best supporting technician in your area that you have access to. So that's the outboard power. Now, if you enjoyed this video, uh, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment. If you're in the market to buy a boat, grab that toolkit um, or attend and or <laughs> attend the U.S. Boat Expo. It's got a bunch of great interviews. It's a it's a really valuable thing. I'll give you a free seven day pass at usboatexpo.com. If you already own a boat, uh, check out the best best boat captain on the water uh, It's a training I put together to make sure that you got the confidence to handle your boat around the docks, trailer it, do everything you need to do. Um, and uh, we've gotten great reviews on that. If you're new, hit that subscribe button, leave a comment, and uh, remember, life truly is better on a boat.